There was something refreshingly haphazard about Mayhew's sampling techniques. For example, he seems to have encountered one of only two false eye makers in London at the time. This one made doll's eyes as a sideline, and Mayhew was no doubt surprised to hear that there were seasonal variations in the trade. There's a, a brisk and a slack season to our business as well as in most others. After the Christmas holidays up to March, we have generally little to do. But from that time, eyes begin to look up a bit and uh, business remains pretty good until the end of October. Where we make one pair of eyes for home consumption, we make 10 for exportation. A great many eyes go abroad. Yes, I suppose we should soon be overpopulated with dolls of a great number were not to emigrate every year. The annual increase of dolls goes on at an alarming rate. The uh, yearly rate of mortality must be very high to be sure, but it's nothing to the rate at which they're brought into the world. I also make human eyes. These are two cases. In the one, I have black and hazel, and in the other, blue and grey. Here, Mayhew reports, the man took the lids off a couple of boxes about as big as binnacles that stood upon the table. They each contained 190 different eyes, and so like nature, Mayhew says, that the effect produced upon a person unaccustomed to the sight was most peculiar and far from pleasant. Here, you see, are the ladies' eyes. You see, they've got more sparkle and brilliance about them than the gentlemen's. Here are two different ladies' eyes. They belong to fine-looking young women, both of them. <laughs> when a lady or a gentleman comes to us for an eye, we're obliged to have a sitting, just like a portrait painter. We take no sketch, but we study the tints of the perfect eye. There are a number of eyes come over from France, but these are generally what we call misfits. They're sold cheap and they seldom match the other eye. And again, by not fitting tight over the ball like those made expressly for the person, they seldom move consentaneously, as it is termed, with the natural eye, and have therefore a very unpleasant and fixed stare. Worse, almost, than the defective eye itself. Now, the eyes that we make have such a natural appearance and move so freely that I can assure you that one gentleman who got one of his from me passed nine doctors without the deception being detected. There is uh, a lady customer of mine who has been married for three years to a husband and I believe he does not know she has a false eye to this day. The generality of persons whom we serve take out their eyes when they go to bed and they either put them under the pillow or else in a tumbler of water are uh, on the toilet table at their side. Most married women, however, never take their eyes out at all. Some people wear out a false eye in half the time of others. This does not arise from the greater use of them or from rolling them about, but from the increased secretion of the tears, which act on the false eye like acid on a metal and corrodes and roughens the surface. This roughness produces inflammation, and so a new eye becomes necessary. The scotch lose a great many eyes. Why? I cannot say. And the men in this country lose more eyes, nearly two to one. We generally only make one eye, but I did once make two eyes for a widow lady. She lost one first, and we repaired the loss so well that on losing the other eye, she got us to make her a second. False eyes are a great charity to servants. If they lose an eye, no one will engage them. In Paris, there's a charitable institution for the supply of false eyes to the poor. And I really think if we had a similar establishment in this country for the furnishing of artificial eyes for those whose bread depends upon their looks, it would do a great deal of good. We always supply eyes to such people at half price. My normal price for an eye is two pounds and two shillings. This eye, for example, is a couple of guineas and as fine an eye as you would wish to see in any young woman's head. <laughs>